Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce, and today we're going to be doing another Indie Horror Spotlight. Today I have with us the creator and producer of a feature-length film that's in pre-production right now, and that's called Aversion. I have with us today Anthony Chila, all the way from Australia. Anthony, welcome to the Horror Room. How you doing, Travis? Good, my friend. Good, my friend. I, I'm, thank you for coming on. No problem. So, tell us a little bit about Aversion. Okay, so I came up with the idea for Aversion. Um, it's based on people with phobias. So, they're real phobias, but they, because I'm a horror horror fan, I, I'm making it in the horror genre or more psychological thriller now. Um, I wanted to address the issue of phobias, but I, but I didn't want to I didn't want to do a piss take as such. But I still wanted to keep it in. Um, in the genre I like to do. So it's basically about five five students who go to a professor's house on the pretext of his wife's funeral. Um, when they end up there, they end up each in a separate room where they have to overcome their phobias, work with each other to try and get out. So it, it, it's a little, we're trying to avoid Saw-esque, but um, it basically, th there's five different phobias and they all, the professor sort of experiments on them, to, uh, but they have to work together to try and get out and, um, yeah, it plays out from there. But I set it to try and have it just a, com a condensed film in one location with minimal actors. There is a small university scene and a couple little bits and pieces here, but it's going to be filmed mainly at night time and um, all in yeah one location, basically. Now, what was some of your inspiration? Did you do any uh, research or uh, background to, uh, on, on, on different kinds of phobias? Uh, not really. I, I just... I knew that I have, I've got a friend with fear of heights and um, a couple of other friends with fears of the dark and stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> what I, I didn't want to, I thought, well, you know, mental, there's a lot of stuff made about mental illness, which is great, but I wanted to do something in the genre that I still like, but something that hasn't really been done before, you know, I haven't seen a lot made on, you've got arachnophobia, which is a, obviously was, that was made years ago. Um, but phobia is like agoraphobia, which is a, a more popular one. I didn't include that one. I included um, some more rare ones like the fear of water, insects, loud noises, the dark, that sort of thing. Um, and the way that people end up for these phobias to play to play out is uh, is more psychological now than I didn't want it to be a slasher horror type of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's going to make you make you think more if you were in that situation. Is that what you would do, basically? And those are the best kind of horrors, the ones that make you think, oh, my goodness this could happen to me. What if I was in this situation and he actually gets your brain working? Exactly. So what got you into filmmaking? So when went about around 2008. I started doing a bit of acting. I did some acting courses here in, in Perth. And, um, but because I'm a little bit bigger guy, there weren't a lot of roles for people my size. So, um, did a little bit. Then around 2016, a friend of mine had a script. It's called black ghost. It was a crime drama and, uh, he wanted to make it. And so, he basically said to me, oh, do you want to produce? And so I thought, oh, I'll give it a go, not knowing what I was getting myself into. <laughs> so he goes, I've got a $5,000 budget. That's it. So I jumped into the deep end. We made a feature for five grand. It's on Tubi. Um, look, it's not the best film. It, it is. We did We did the best with, what, with the budget that we had. Um, and I'm not with that production company anymore. I've got my own one now. But, uh, yeah, I got into that, and I actually enjoy being on the other side of the camera and organizing all the logistical side of it than, than acting. I did a little bit of acting in that film, just a few bits and pieces here and there. But, uh, yeah, that's basically what got me into it. And, now, do you think by, by working on both sides of the cameras, it, it has helped you overall? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I tried to I tried my hand at directing for a short film, but, um, yeah, that I'm not going to go there. So, but, uh, yeah, it, it does because, <laughs> because I know – it's a, sometimes I think it can be detrimental because I know how I want would want it to play out the particular scene if I was acting in it. But then I know that the actors, that's what they do. That's what they're trained at. And so I've sort of got to let them go ahead and do it, if you know what I mean, um, but still try and keep the vision of how the film uh, is to play out, yeah. And I'm interviewing a lot of filmmakers from Australia when it comes to horror. Australia, it seems like it is definitely, there's a huge resurgence in horror there. Uh, have, have you noticed that as well? Yeah, well, the, some of the research that myself and my other director is now co-producer did is that horror and faith-based films are the ones that are selling best online at the moment here, especially here in Australia. Wow. So um, on Tubi, for example, and um, other platforms like that, 
it's there was one made in Sydney, I think, for fifty thousand a few years ago, and it's made back around one hundred and fifty thousand in six months, roughly, because wow. it's a it's a horror. So, people for some reason like to be scared. A lot of the women that work on my set said they don't like making horror, but they like well, they don't like watching horror, but they like making it. So it's sort of, um, <laughs> but yeah, there's definitely a resurgence. The problem with me is I, I haven't found except for Deliver Us from Evil. I probably haven't really found any horrors lately. That, uh, that I, I tend to watch Tubi just for a lot of the independent films to see what's getting put on there and some of the budgets that people have and what what's made in that budget. So Now, this, you, you bring up Tubi. Tubi is absolutely amazing. I've been a two, fan of Tubi for years. And one thing great about Tubi is, you know, as someone who's, you know, I live in the States and I'm an indie horror fan, it gives you an option to see indie other indie horror all throughout the whole entire world. It's just not the United States. And I, I, I definitely, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Now, now ha, over the years, have you seen it a little bit easier to get your work out now? Yeah. Well, the, again, the, the guy I'm working with, he's got a good relationship with a company called Indie Rights. And basically they were, we went through a third party called Bounty Entertainment who were able to get our film onto Tubi. Um, but, I find it's easier to get it on there than, say, Netflix. And um, there is Shutter. Shutter's sort of – it's not as not as um, lucrative as far as getting your return. Um, there is Thriller Films who – oh, sorry. Yeah, Thriller Films who are going to try and get to distribute as well. But the, the problem with that is if you get your film on Netflix, then once, say, they say they take it for two or three years – that's it. No other, no other streaming platform will touch you because you, you've already had it on the big boy of all the, you know, oh, wow. the, the the daddy of all the streaming platforms. Yeah. So, if you go on the smaller ones like Tubi and that for a bit, then you can maybe apply to uh, try and get it on Netflix later. But um, Tubi's starting to to get up there to get up to the Netflix level. I mean, obviously it's free to watch because they make all their money off the ads when the mm-hmm. people pay for the ads. But yeah, I mean, it's a lot bigger than it is now. And like you said, there's just films from from all different countries. I, I, there's a lot of foreign korean films i've been watching as well um yes and there's a couple of good ones on netflix like alice from borderland and a few like that like train train last train to busan is a good one amazing um, yeah so i found yeah i just sit there and watch tubi i just flick through go through horror or whatever and there are some that are that are quite bad <laughs> there's others that, but you know and the thing the thing with that is people are like oh this film's really bad and then you comment, well, show us what you've made. And they're like, oh, we don't make films. Exactly. I'm like, well, I'll, I'll catch you later. You know what I mean? So all these keyboard warriors that are out there thinking that they can do a better job, but they don't. But, you know, kudos to anyone who makes it. I've got a guy who, from the States who wants me to review a film, $1,000 budget. I watched it on Tubi. And look, for the budget, it's it's what you expect. But yeah. it's still out there and he still made something. So, you know, you, you, can't, you can't go bagging these people because they're doing the best they can. I mean, I give anybody who's a filmmaker just slap, uh, you know, a round of applause because it's got balls. I mean, you, you, you're you you're putting skin into the game, and, like, it's something that I personally couldn't do. So, I mean, I, I appreciate anybody who's putting their art out there and putting their, in, in their eyes their masterpiece out there for people to, to view and, unfortunately, even critique. Um, mm. now, now, when it comes to streaming services, there's a lot of stream summers coming out. It's like it seems like there's another there's another one each day. Do you think that that is watering it down the actual market, or do you think it's giving filmmakers more opportunity? I think it's a bit of both because if I know some people that just make short films and they try to make a career out of short films, and there are certain platforms designed just for short films um, that you can put them onto. There's one. There's little ones called Plex and a few other little ones. Uh, platforms here and there but amazon prime for example have now basically culled all independent films they're just taking big films they went from paying i think it was 12 cents per to the streaming minute order to to one cent so wow. it, yeah so they're they're so now these other platforms are allowing us to put our films on there and you might not make a lot but you know you're going to get some sort of a return every three months like i still get a little bit from black ghost but it's not you know, it's nothing to write home about. I can go buy a coffee or do something like that. But, you know, it, it's still people are still watching it, are still getting eyes on it. And I feel that even if you – I'd rather have it on lots of small platforms and rely on lots of smaller bits of income than have to rely on like someone like Netflix to try and give you one big amount of income and, you know, hopefully – uh, because even Netflix, you've got to pay about 1500 to apply, and if you don't get it on there, you don't get that money back. So, um, Really? Yeah. And so that's uh, I'd ra- I'd rather put it in a lot of smaller places and, and bring in lots of little income and have it build up over time, than try and rely on one of the big 
bigger platforms to just say, okay, here you go, here's whatever it is, and we'll take it for three years, and that's it. What do you think is the biggest struggle right now as a any filmmaker? Uh, here, here in here in Perth and Australia in general is financing. So, I've I've got a lot of friends in the UK and the US who make films. They run crowdfunders and they always get them funded. The Mahal brothers, I don't know if you know of them, but they're one of the biggest. They've had all sixteen film of their films fully funded over over two three hundred thousand, and they're using actors like Robert Lasato and Tara Reid and all that sort of thing because they're able to get a good day rate. But here, it's more – people have said it's more of a hobby. So, you know, I was trying to do a crowdfunded before for five grand and I got $200. So it's – people don't don't see it as – they're trying to – I'm trying to get them to invest in more, me more than the film. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's why I'm trying to get a version made. If I can get that made as essentially my first feature under this under my production company, then it might help get the ball rolling. Like, okay, I could actually get it made, that sort of thing. But – like our budget's very low. Thirty grand is what we're after. Um, I have got someone that's putting in ten, but at the moment we're only up to two hundred and seventy dollars on the crowdfunder. And this is people wanting a tax a tax benefit, but they're they're, they're not putting it in, even though we've got it going. So, um, you know, I run a Facebook group called Perth Filmmaking Community, and there's five thousand members in there. And I said to them, even if they all just put in ten dollars each, it would help. But they'd rather buy two coffees for that. So, here, that's what we're up against. Um, I've got my first AD flying in from America, actually, for a version. Um, and he's a full-time – he does it full-time, flies between the US and the UK. And he just said even getting even getting access to B-grade actors or C-grade actors is a lot easier there than here. Like, I'd have to fly someone in from Sydney, but then I can't put their name on the box because no one knows who they are. So that's – in Australia, that's what we're, we're up against a lot more than, than other countries. Because, I mean, you were speaking about Korea. Like, Korea now – is on a map when it comes to horror. Yeah, you know, they put us on Train of Busan, Alive. There's been, I mean, even Squid Games and and like you said, Alice in Borderland. Uh, are you hoping that Australia would uh, would now or you put their name on the mark as a you know? Because I think maybe the issue is that most Americans don't know Australian horror. They don't even know what is what to watch. That is even there. Don't you think? I mean, do you think that it just takes a couple? indie filmmakers to hit it big and put something good out there to get the rest of the world's attention. Absolutely. I mean, we had Wolf Creek. I don't know if you saw that. And we've had, uh, yes. Yeah. There's a new one come out called talk to me, which is about a hand that's possessed with, uh, with spirits. And every time you touch the hand, that person, actually the, the person actually gets inside you. The best, best horror movie of the year, in my opinion. Yeah. So that, that was filmed here. So, but yeah, there's a lot of, we look at some of the stuff that is made overseas and we're like, well, if we had that budget, we could do a much better job here. There, There is a film studio now being built here in Perth. So it's going to take 2026, I think the first production studio to be made, but that we haven't had one here. They're all in Sydney, Melbourne, Queensland. So we're finally getting one here. But again, that's going to attract people like for you know, Marvel and things like that. Whereas people like us won't be able to afford to use the sound stages or anything. So, some of us try to band together to try and find our own locations and we might team up and try and make a production, but everyone knows everyone here. So every time I go to a film premiere, I know the filmmakers from other, other films or you use the same soundies or whatever. But I think if we can get at least a couple of decent projects out there, even on platforms and YouTube um, or some film festivals, I think they would realize what sort of stuff comes out of Australia and, and how good some of our even no name, not, no name talent is like we've got some really good actors here in, in Perth as well, and they just unfortunately aren't getting the recognition that they need to be able to to, to get to that next step. That's a shame. That's a shame. Yes, I, and I I have seen Talk to Me, and that is an amazing. By the way, if you haven't seen that, it's an amazing movie. It's an amazing. Movie. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So now, so you are running a crowdfunding, and it's through the Australian Culture Fund. Tell us Culture a little fund, bit. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what that is. Okay, so basically the the difference between that and, say, Indiegogo, Indiegogo you get perks. You, you know, you could get a, a T-shirt or, or a DVD or poster or whatever they give you. Um, the difference with this one is it's based purely for Australians. So if you put in money, it's 100% tax deductible depending on the tax bracket you're in. So, for example, if you put in $10,000 and you're in a 35% tax bracket, you're getting – Back roughly three and a half to four thousand dollars when you do your tax, you just hand in the, you give them the receipt. So, if you earn a hundred grand a year, you're only you're only claiming ninety because you're getting that back essentially. But that's it. You don't get any other any other perks or or rewards or anything like that. 
um, people from overseas, if they put in, then I will give them an associate producer credit or executive producer, whatever credit they want, because they're not going to get the tax rebate because they're overseas. Um, there is another way that I have for people to invest. It is if you put your money in, say $1,000, and the film makes the budget, you'll get 20%. So you get 12 and a half, 1250 back. But then every if the if the film makes anything over that, say it makes ten thousand, five thousand of that goes to the investor, and they make fifty cents in the dollar every time the film makes money. But again, that's a bit more risky because they're they're going on the premise the film's going to make some money, mm -hmm. whereas the tax benefit at least they're getting something back at the end of the year. So that's why people have asked us to put this crowdfunder together specifically, so that they're not taking the risk of not getting anything back from the film. They're at least getting a tax credit, but they're not getting the residual income of the film if it makes money after the budget. So it's a little bit a little bit convoluted the way it works, but it, it's designed mainly for people here in Australia to invest, hopefully. And um, people overseas can do it and I'll give them the appropriate credit that they that they've asked for. Amazing. Now I've I've talked to filmmakers in Europe and like Europe has some kind of they, they have some kind of grant or or a loan mm -hmm. for filmmakers there. Is that something that Australia has or? Yeah, we have a company called Screen West. So they're funded by, say, we have a company called Lottery West. So they'll give them a grant. They might give them $8 million, for example. And they can either fund one project or they can fund multiple. So they're like the governing body of if you want to get a, a like a big budget film made. So you'll put in a proposal to them. They'll look at it and they'll say, okay, we'll give you a million dollars. And then Screen Australia, who are in, Queensland will jump in and say, here's some more money and you can go ahead and make it. The problem with that is there's a lot of hoops to jump through. They want a certain percentage back. They want a director that's had, I think, three um, international screenings. They want certain actors. They want to rewrite the script. So there's a lot of things you have to do to get that. Um, but besides that, we don't really have anything else. We, we have, you know, you could go to a remote a remote community and maybe get a rural grant. They might say, okay, here's, a, here's I don't know, $10,000 to film here, but you have to use one of, say, the Indigenous actors or something like that. So there's small small little grants like that, but the majority is the the, the government funding, but that's that's extremely hard to get. Okay. So what were some horror movies that got you into horror? Well, I'm a, obviously a big Jason and, and Michael Myers fan and Freddie, but... Um, yeah, just stuff like even Silent Hill, uh, Hills Have Eyes, um, even Thirteen Ghosts. That's one. Of, that's one of my favourites. That's um, a great it's one. probably not a, probably not a horror as such, but I spit on your grave. That was I, I enjoyed that film. Um, and uh, Deliver Us from Evil is one of my one of my favourites so far with Eric Banner. I'm not sure if you've seen that one. Yes, I have. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. based on a true based on a true events. Yeah, so um, I actually watched some behind the scenes and. When Eric, Eric Banner listened to the actual exorcism that happened, he wouldn't let the cast or crew listen to it because it was because he was freaked out by it too much. So, <laughs> whoa, he's from yeah. Australia, right? Yeah, he's Australian. Yes, yes, yes. And so it's Hugh, Hugh Jackman, and we have a guy here, Miles Pollard, who's probably one of the bigger actors in Perth besides Sam Worthington. Um, and he was in one of the X Men movies, but he was just like a an extra that would talk to Wolverine. Um, so. He he does acting classes here, but he's sort of the bigger biggest name we've got here besides Sam Worthington, essentially, and Jai Courtney. Yeah. So, have, have, do you already have filming locations already picked out? Yeah. So we're going to have to use an Airbnb. Um, we're just trying to obviously lock that in, and then um, we get that for about I think ten nights, and we leave all the all the equipment there, and a couple of us will stay there, and then we just film say five thirty p.m. till maybe four a.m. And then where we're looking is good because most people, if they want, they just drive home. They're only 20 minutes from the location. So That's um, nice. I don't really want them driving after, after doing a 10 hour shoot, but you know, it's yeah. better than it's, it's better than all of us because the problem, if they're all staying there, it means all the beds are messed up and we need them for props. So I'd rather just have them have the beds stay there, set up the way they are. We just use them the next day. So. Cause I heard that it gets hot as hell there. Well, we're actually having a heat wave. We had, 44 degrees Celsius two days ago, um, and it was wow. 41, de 41 degrees Celsius. So I don't know what the conversion is over there, but it's that's pretty hot. So like, I mean, so like, when it comes to filming, like, are you, I guess everything indoors would be smart to do. 
Well, I mean, yeah, but when, when we filmed the when we filmed the proof of concept, it was winter, and we had to try and have the heaters on and the fires on and and all that going, and the air cons on reverse cycle because it was so cold. So it was like maybe ten degrees at the most Celsius. So, um, yeah, in the winter it, it can get uh, it can get hot. So um, and it can also get not as cold as over there, obviously. So forty four here is one hundred and eleven degrees Fahrenheit. That is, <laughs> <laughs> that is insane. That is insane. Because yeah, I, I so. actually follow another Australian, uh, Australian filmmaker, and she was posting like, "I am melting here. It's like yeah. 110 degrees." I'm like, "Whoa! I can't even imagine yeah. that." Yeah. So one one someone had a photo of some eggs they put in a frying pan and put it on the road, and it was cooking the eggs on the road. So it's uh, but if you go up north, if you go five or six hours up north, it gets to about 50 degrees. There's a place called Marble Bar. It's the hottest place on earth. Um, so they're getting a 50, 52 degrees. Yeah. Jeez. So, but yeah, so I've got my aircon cranking, so you might hear that in the background because yeah. it's still about, it's, it's about 20, 21 here at the moment at night time. So, jeez. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. All right. So, Anthony, I'm going to ask you three hard questions. Are you ready? Okay. Yep. All right. The first one if you could cast any iconic horror actor, actress in one of your movies, who would it be? Uh, a, a grader, big grader. Any, anyone? Anyone. Okay. I uh, actually I'd probably cast Kane Hodder just because I really liked the way that he uh he played. I think it was was Mike Myers he played? No, Jason. Jason he played yes. Jason. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I've watched him on a couple of um paranormal shows as well. And yeah, I think he'd be good to play a villain. You're you put him in as a villain. Yeah. By the way, I have always been curious what would Kane Hodder look like as a good guy in a movie? I don't know that. That'd be interesting. It'd be good to to flip, flip the role, flip, flip the script as such, yes. and, and put him in a as a good guy. People were like, "Wait a minute! I came here to see Kane Hunter kill people, and like he's over here the good guy." Like, yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. what I signed up for. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> a second question: What what was the first movie you saw growing up that scared the shit out of you? Uh the first one I saw probably would have been one of the 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 Jason films um, just because back then I wasn't used to all the head, heads being cut off and the, you know, the intestines being ripped out and that sort of thing. Um, and then I th- after that, I'd say it would have been Blair Witch because obviously the way it came off was it was a true story. So I watched it and I was sleeping with some lights on that night. So um, it wasn't until after you found out that it wasn't real, but yeah, I'd say the new one would be Blair Witch, but when I was younger, it was definitely uh, the Jason films. By the way, I've, I've, I, I, recently I've talked to so many people who have said the same thing, Blair Witch, and like a, lo- a lot of people forget how, at the, like when I was like fifteen or sixteen when, when the first Blair Witch came out, and I bought it on VHS and I thought it was real, and I put it in, and it wasn't, and the movie scared the shit out of me, but it wasn't because of anything you saw; it was the unknown, yeah. you know. And and I even say too that that scene where the guy is standing in the corner freaked me the hell out. Oh yeah, yeah. It it's, freaks it's, me out. And and the fact that they went to Canada to do a screening and they put up all missing posters, uh, missing persons posters, but had to take them down because there was actually an active missing persons case in Canada at the time, so they weren't even oh, able to shit. put up the posters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, because I mean, there was a website looking for these missing yeah. people. It, it they, they were actually they went all out to like, hey, this is something that's real happening right now, and this is a real thing, and like you didn't know at the time. No, nah. and that was extremely low budget as well. That was made on, I think it was about thirty or forty thousand, maybe. A bit, a bit, yeah, bit more. Made like a hundred million dollars, or something yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, so it's, um, but now they've tried to make sequels, and it's just one of those films you leave alone, like The Crow yep. and things like that. So, but that's a whole another whole another rabbit hole. <laughs> I know. By the way, I just rewatched the original Crow, and I I heard that they're making a remake. I'm like, please don't. Like the, the original got, Crow was Alexander was, Skarsgård, I think. Yes. yes. Same with Blade. They're making a, 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 a remaking Blade with that um, Ali guy. Just, yes. just leave it alone. Looking, yeah, I'm, that's my thing. Like, let's start making remakes and let's find something creative and new to add on. I mean, but, but I think that. that's the problem with Hollywood. I think Hollywood's running out of orig- original ideas. So they're just they're like Pet Cemetery when they remade that. Now people criticise that, but the actors, the script was underdeveloped, and you can only do so much with the script as an actor. So. I think they need to start coming up with original ideas and instead of just making remakes of everything. But that's just my opinion anyway. 
Oh, no, I want to be so great, but, I'm, uh, but even like when it comes to the crow, there's comic and blade, like there's comic books that like that haven't gotten a story yet, like mm. you know, and like why not try something new? Why not? Yep. I, but I think it is because they're afraid to. It's it's the risk behind it. Like when you have an proven success in something, mm-hmm. let's keep doing it over and over and over again. I mean, I want, I'm not a big fan of, of fan films, but I, I wanted to make one of John Wick versus The Punisher to see who would win. And just, oh, that'd be fucking amazing! Know, yes, I mean, my money's on John Wick, but I think they're definitely as good as each other. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All <laughs> right. N- next question. Hmm. Let me see. Okay. If you could reboot any, so we were to we talk about not, we don't like rebooting, but if you if you could personally reboot any iconic horror movie and put your own spin and your own spice on it, which one would it be? I'd say I'd probably re redo um maybe one of the uh See, I've I've seen a, quite a few out of, out of left field ones, but the more common ones I'd say probably would be a Friday the Thirteenth, um, or or a Freddy one. But I've seen a lot of, like I said on Tubi, a lot of out there ones, but ones that have made a bit of bit of money back. Like there was one called VHS, I think it was. Yes. Um, Su- Super Eight as well, those sort of ones, you know. But um, I'd say out of the out of the iconic ones, it'd probably be either a, a Freddy or a um or a, a Friday the Thirteenth. What would your spin? Want to be? Uh, the, the spit. I get. I'm. I'm someone that likes the, the bad guys to get away at the end because it's all predictable. Okay, you know they kill them and they die type of thing. So, I guess I'd have it as either they've got one of the either the sister or or someone's an accomplice with them, or they just end up getting away at the end and everyone do, everyone else dies. Something like that, or there'd be even there'd be something where. It's out of left field where you wouldn't expect it. Like it's just someone involved that you you don't know, or it's actually not the person you think it is. That type of thing. Um, because it, it's I don't like films that are predictable. Like I, I watch stuff now, even on Netflix, and I'm, and my wife's like, I say to her, it's going to end this way. Have you seen it before? No, and it's, that's exactly how it ends. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's it's and I guess every film you're going to have a little bit of level of that. I'm trying to get out, get away from that with a version, but. There may be bits and pieces where you're like, oh, oh, yeah, I thought that would happen, but I guess you can't. That happens in every film. There's not a lot you can do about it. Yeah, because, I mean, wouldn't it be nice for once in a horror movie if the asshole fucking lived? Like, the guy who was an mm. asshole. Like, you know he's going to die in every movie. You know the good girl is going to be the one alive. But wouldn't it be incredible if, like, the asshole guy lived? Yeah, exactly. It's like, come on, guys. I mean, in real life, if, if you've got this dude that's chasing, that's coming after you and killing everyone, how many of you are actually going to have the balls to be able to 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 take him on and live? You know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. It's just, even if there's a bunch of you, he's he's got the I don't know if it's a superhuman strength or whatever it is, but he's got the ability. It's what he's been doing. It's what he's trained to do, and um, you know, a bit like Rambo dying. So, yes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's designed to, to kill everyone and get a, and live, you know. So that'd be a good spin. They have have Rambo or Rocky die or something, but yeah, <laughs> that'd be that'd be a great spin to toss R- Rambo into Camp Crystal Lake against Jason. Yeah, see who would win out of him and uh, him and Rambo. I th- I, my, yeah. my money would be on Jason though. <laughs> it's definitely gonna be Jason. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. do you make film? Do you make films yourself? I do not. I'm just a film okay. watcher and a film yeah. lover. I love indie horror. I grew up on, you know, VHS days, and I yep. grew up on the full moon and trauma and uh, direct the video uh, yeah, horror. Yeah. So I definitely yeah. have a, a place in my heart for indie horror. Well, definitely give us a um, a, uh, like a comment on what you think of the short that I've sent you for a version. Um, the actors have changed, so those actors aren't going to be in it. We've recast, but you get the idea of what it's one scene from the film. Um, that scene will be shot again, a little bit different, but you'll get the idea of what we were going for. So you probably guess a few of the phobias while you're watching it, um, but it was designed purely as a proof of concept to try and get investment. So and it just happened to win an award, which was Sweet. which was even better. Yeah. Now, what's your phobia? I guess if I had if I had one, it would probably be maybe snakes. Snakes. Um, I don't. I don't really have. I'm not really afraid of the dark. I don't mind heights. Um, spiders, well, I could just use my shoe if I need to get rid of them, um, that sort of thing. But <laughs> I don't really have, I don't really have a phobia. Oh, working maybe, 
Um, that's yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> but no, I'd say. I said it with snakes because some of them I'm, I, I, don't, I don't really run, so it's kind of I'm not I know I'm not getting away from them if I'm in their environment. So um, yeah, and I guess maybe sharks as well, but I don't I don't go to the beach because they tend to roll me back in. So <laughs> I uh, I tend to stay away from that. Yeah, but that's that's it. I don't really have I don't really have a fight per se. Heights is, is definitely mine, like one hundred percent, and. Like I listen, I've been on a plane probably a thousand times. So uh, like flying, I've gotten used to that. Still get mm-hmm. a little nervous, but it's like getting on a ladder and going on top of a roof or a roller coaster. My mind is always thinking, "What if?" You know, my mind is always. By the way, so other thing is too. I work in death care, so like. I've seen people die in every possible way, right? So my mind, in every situation, my mind is like, oh, I've seen someone fall off a ladder and die before. I've seen somebody on an amusement park ride and fling out and die. Like, I don't want that. So, like, heights terrify me. Yeah, I mean, I I, like, I don't go on roller coasters only because I don't I, – I feel sick. It's not for the fact that they're scary or anything. I just I, I just feel sick at the end of it, and I don't see the point in – in doing that because it spoils the rest of the day. It's like chili. I don't eat hot food because what's the point in burning your taste buds off? So yeah. it's not a phobia as such. I just don't see the point in, in it for myself doing it anyway. People enjoy it, but bumper cars are probably my, or dodgems are probably my scariest one. So <laughs> if we go on them. <laughs> see, I can do bumper cars. I can definitely do bumper yeah, cars. Um, anything yeah. on the ground, I'm, I'm good with. Yeah, yeah. Anthony, where can everyone find you? Uh, I'm on Facebook. So just type in Seize the Day Studios on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, um, TikTok, I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, all the all the main social medias. But I mainly post on YouTube, and I ru- also run Perth Filmmaking Community on Facebook. So even if you're not from Australia, you can jump on there. I've got 5,000 members roughly. People post up casting calls. They post up films, trailers, whatever on there. So, um, But, yeah, mainly YouTube and Facebook. If you just type in Caesar Day Studios, you'll find it. Or just type my name in on Facebook, and um, I post some stuff on there. Sweet. And everyone down in the link is going to be the link to Anthony's YouTube as well mm-hmm. as the link to the Australian Culture Fund. So yep. please, you know, donate if you're in a, if you're in the states. There's amazing uh, associate producer, executive producer perks. If you're in Australia, there's some great tax benefits. And also, if if you want to go to the other extreme, I am willing to take crypto as well. All right, just because I know <laughs> we can cash it out. I know we've got to pay tax on it, but yeah, if people were because I had someone say to me once, they they gave some crypto to someone, and a hundred dollars to them in crypto doesn't equate to a hundred dollars in like, actual proper currency. If you know what I mean, they they mm-hmm. they don't think they didn't feel it was the same. So by them giving a hundred dollars in Bitcoin, it's not they didn't think it was the same as giving actual physical like hundred dollar note. So I don't don't know why, but it's just how mm-hmm. how it played out in their mind. So. I think they were more willing to give the, give it that way than than um, you know out of their bank account or whatever. It was just well, something crypt- strange. Well, crypto and Bitcoin is an option too, so no excuse, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, how, so how how do you go being a mortician? So, long story short, it's it's something that I grew up into. So, like, long story short, it was a family thing, and then, like, I just fell into it. So, do you embalm the bodies and everything, or is that what you do? Um, I handle more so now the admin side and the management okay. side of things, but, yes, that's something I've done for a long time. Wow. It'd be interesting to see how all that works. <laughs> it actually made me not want to get buried. Like once the once you see an, what a bombing process looks like, you're not going to want. You're like, Ugh, I want to be cremated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. It's a. It's that's a, interesting. It's a barbaric process, but <laughs> hey, look, it's. it's Tradition. It's tradition. So we've got to respect people's religious beliefs and tradition. We were talking about that last night. Would you rather be buried or cremated? And people were a bit 50-50. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's either be eaten by worms or be burnt by fire. Yeah. I mean, cremation here in the States right now, it's like 60% cremation, 40% 
traditional barrel, but when you see traditional barrel, like, so I live in Maryland, so when you start seeing, you see, mostly you see traditional barrel in the South, so that's more conservatives. That's like Maryland, Virginia, North, the, yeah. the Carolinas, Georgia. But when you go to, like, the West Coast or even up further east, like New York or the West Coast to uh, Arizona or Nevada and California, cremation, cremation, cremation. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, right. But, Interesting. Yep, but, I mean, here in this country, I mean, you know, cremation is about to be the, be the majority. Over. Yep. Yeah, right. And how long does it roughly take for a body to completely turn to ash? It depends on the person's eyes, believe it or not. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I thought once you set the heat, that was it. It was the same for everyone. It depends on the person's eyes. Like, of course, bigger people, people, they have a lot more fat to burn. And, yeah, okay. Yep. By the way, I, I feel like I should do a, a live interview where, like, ask a mortician, and people can just come on and just ask me questions about what it's like Absolutely. to be a mortician. <laughs> I think that would be a great video. Do it dressed up as Jason or something. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Have a bloody smock on or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. But you know what? That might be a future video. So awesome. if, if you want to see that future video, probably next month, make sure to hit that like and the subscribe button. All right. Well, Anthony, yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, my friend. Mm -hmm. And it's everyone. It's been great chatting to you as well. And I've been following a lot of the guys. I've been watching a lot of your videos and I've been going and subscribing to their channels to watch what they do as well because I, I just think even if they're a big channel or a small channel to help support them is is is, is just helps everyone get out there. And then when it comes to the indie horror, like we're on, I don't want to say we're on our own, but we're on our own. So like we have yeah. to build each other. We have to work with each other. We have to make sure that all of us grow. If all of, if if you grow, I grow. That's the way I, I see That's it. Right, yeah. yeah. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for coming to the horror room. I'm Travis Bruce. I'll see you guys next time. Take care. Thank you.